the Earth was hit by multiple fragments of a giant comet 12,800 years ago, and that this caused a huge rise in sea level and extinctions of megafaunas. They are not saying that it also wiped out a, a lost advanced civilization of prehistory. Antarctica is a place of great beauty and mystery. Its landscape is a masterpiece of ice and snow, sculpted by the relentless forces of nature over millennia. Towering glaciers, shimmering icebergs, and expansive ice shelves create a breathtaking panorama that stretches as far as the eye can see. The stark white of the ice contrasts with the deep blue of the surrounding sea, while the jagged peaks of mountains pierce the endless expanse of the Antarctic sky. Against this backdrop, the sun paints the horizon with hues of pink, purple, and gold during the brief polar summer, casting an ethereal glow over the icy landscape. But beneath its breathtaking scenery, Antarctica harbors mysteries that have puzzled scientists and explorers for centuries. The continent's extreme isolation and harsh climate have preserved its secrets, making it one of the least explored and least understood regions on Earth. Amid the unknown, Graham Hancock, a well-known author who has explored various theories regarding ancient civilizations and lost knowledge, has proposed a shocking revelation that could completely turn Antarctica's historical timeline upside down. One thing that they used to say is, Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. But is Hancock's idea possible? Could Antarctica have been home to an advanced civilization that existed before the last ice age? Did an advanced civilization disappear more than 12,000 years ago? Join us as we dig deep into how Graham Hancock just upended our understanding of the White Continent. In a time long before the icy expanse of Antarctica became synonymous with freezing temperatures and polar desolation, the southernmost continent harbored a surprising secret. It was once home to a lush rainforest millions of years ago, this revelation challenges our conventional understanding of Earth's geological history and sheds light on the dynamic nature of our planet. The ancient Antarctic rainforest is believed to have thrived during the Cretaceous period, approximately 90 to 100 million years ago. The evidence for this extraordinary claim comes from fossilized remnants of plant life discovered in the Transantarctic Mountains. These fossils tell a tale of a vastly different climate where temperatures were milder and Antarctica was covered with dense vegetation. During this prehistoric era, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana, situated closer to the South Pole but still positioned in a way that allowed for temperate conditions. The rainforest, teeming with diverse flora and fauna, flourished in a landscape that seems incompatible with our contemporary understanding of the frozen continent. It would have had to be about 2,000 to 2,500 miles from the South Pole to support the fauna and flora that has been found there in fossil form. Now here is a big question. How did Antarctica end up at the South Pole? Well, the short answer is it had to move. Settled science speaks of two ways the lithosphere, the Earth's crust, moves. One is plate tectonics and the other is continental drift. By very definition, we would have to assume that it would take many millions of years for Antarctica to move as far as it had to in order to end up square in the middle of the South Pole with either or both forces working. But it seems to have happened quickly. Another important point is, although the time is all over the place when you study this, Antarctica, we are told, has been totally covered with ice for 1.5 million years, or as much as 2 million years. Now we come to the smoking gun, facts that turn the historical timeline upside down and demand answers from a variety of scientific disciplines. Graham Hancock, a well-known author who has explored various theories regarding ancient civilizations and lost knowledge, has proposed that Antarctica may have been home to an advanced civilization that existed before the last ice age. He suggests that geological and other anomalies in the region 
could indicate the presence of structures or artifacts from this civilization. It's because there was a period in, in the Earth's uh, geological history that geologists call the Younger Dryas, which lasted for 1,200 years, from 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. It's a very mysterious period. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. It's a, it's a cataclysmic uh, epoch very much on North America, now as far south as Antarctica, as far east as Syria. This was truly a global, a global event, and, and it changed the world. And I think, and it's my case, that it wiped our memory of a previous episode of, of human civilization, that right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. To support this idea, Hancock starts off by pointing out the presence of many old maps that accurately show the planet in a way that should have been inconceivable in those days. The Piri Race map, which depicts the coastlines of South America and Africa with an accuracy that demonstrates his knowledge of sophisticated charting, is one of the most well-known examples. The Piri Race map is a world map compiled in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Race. Approximately one-third of the map survives, housed in the Topkapu Palace in Istanbul. When rediscovered in 1929, the remaining fragment garnered international attention as it includes a partial copy of an otherwise lost map by Christopher Columbus. The map is a portolan chart with compass roses and a windrose network for navigation, rather than lines of longitude and latitude. It contains extensive notes, primarily in Ottoman Turkish. The depiction of South America is detailed and accurate for its time. Scholars attribute the peculiar arrangement of the Caribbean to a now-lost map from Columbus that depicted Cuba as part of the Asian mainland and Hispaniola, according to Marco Polo's description of Japan. The southern coast of the Atlantic Ocean is widely accepted to be a version of Terra Australis. What's notable is the map hints at the presence of a land mass where Antarctica is, albeit one with no ice. The outline of the supposed Antarctic depiction more closely resembles the physical land of the Antarctic continent than it does the ice pack, which stretches out into the ocean beyond the land. So, if Peary Race did manage to make it that far south, he should have drawn the outline of Antarctic ice, not the land. Unless, of course, he had some special knowledge that others lacked. In addition to an unfrozen Antarctica, the map features other details that have led some minds to speculate that Piri Rice's cartographic knowledge must have been derived from even earlier maps or documents, now lost to time, created by some unknown but highly advanced civilization who explored the world long before our recorded history. These earlier people must have visited and possibly inhabited Antarctica before it froze over, proof that Antarctica was once populated, or not. We can't deny the fact that the Antarctica that Piri Rees depicted was likely hypothetical. It was widely believed for centuries that the world ought to include a southern continent to balance out the land masses on the other side of the world. However, Piri Reis was hardly the only one to incorporate that belief into his work. In 1531, a French mathematician and cartographer, Orontius Phineas, published a world map that included Antarctica. It seemed to indicate the buildup of ice in the interior of the continent, but a great deal of the landmass is clearly shown to be ice-free. Mountain ranges and rivers are clearly seen, and the map is, again, amazingly accurate when compared with our latest knowledge of subglacial topography today. In 1737, a French geographer named Philippe Boisch drew a map of Antarctica that shows the entire continent free of ice. Not until the International Geophysical Year, which lasted from 1st of July 1957 to 31st December 1958, did we have any real idea how Antarctica looked under the ice. A seismic survey was taken of the entire continent at that time. The Bauche map proves to be astonishingly accurate in its detail. Three maps clearly show that mankind knew of the continent of Antarctica, 
had accurately surveyed it in various stages of the development of the ice sheet and drew detailed, accurate maps. Now, you must not miss the fact that all of these maps were drawn before Antarctica was discovered. There are other maps not referenced here. All of the referenced cartographers used sources that go back into great antiquity. Some, perhaps, as far back as 13,000 years. There were successive source maps used by a chain of cartographers, each more ancient. Obviously, the map drawn by Philippe Boucher was drawn from more ancient sources than that of Piri Race. But, the maps cited make a point that Antarctica appeared to be not completely covered in ice until about 6,000 years ago. The maps show longitude accurately, something we were not able to do until the latter part of the 18th century. The maps make it evident that the ancient cartographers had knowledge of spherical trigonometry as well. That make many believe the ancient surveyors and cartographers were people who actually lived in Antarctica as the ice sheet began to develop. Every indication is that Antarctica was ice-free about 13,000 years ago, thriving in a temperate climate zone, and then suddenly moved to the South Pole, where polar ice began to form and advance. The interesting thing is that we are told that about this same time, 13,000 years ago, the Ice Age ended, so we are left to conclude that as one Ice Age ended, another began, just in different parts of the world. Antarctica was completely free of ice, and not that long ago. This is at total variance with current, settled science that tells us the continent of Antarctica has been totally covered in ice from this very day back to about 1.5 million years ago. Now, settled science has a real dilemma. We are told that the people who were the original cartographers of the referenced maps were hunter and gatherers still living in caves and had only figured out how to scratch their butts about 12,000 years ago. This is what we're told by experts. Or, they lived 1.5 million years or so, ago, at a time they tell us when the descendants of modern man, Homo sapiens, didn't even exist. The point is that at no time since Antarctica has been covered with ice has man existed who could have known it, let alone survey it repeatedly over time to show the progression of the ice cap from its initial formation until it completely covered the continent. There was no civilization on Earth 6,000 years age. While settled science offers no explanation, Graham Hancock said that he had some ideas. Hancock's main claim is that during the last Ice Age, which ended about 12,000 years ago, our world was ruled by a mysterious, advanced civilization whose grip extended over all the continents on Earth until it ended in an apocalyptic flood. The survivors of the flood were those who taught humans of the Stone Age, the secrets of agriculture, architecture, and all the other advanced technologies necessary for the existence of complex human civilizations. And then Hancock addresses the question of why nothing at all has been written about this advanced, ancient civilization in history books and textbooks. In the words of Hancock, a civilization even more glorious than ancient Mesopotamia, Babylonia, and Egypt, was thoroughly wiped out by a comet strike around 12,000 years ago that nearly all evidence of its existence vanished, leaving only the faintest of traces, including a cryptic warning that such a celestial catastrophe could happen to us. Other claim is that it disappeared in a flood and left very few traces. Third, he claims that humans have forgotten about its existence. And then he concludes with the conspiratorial explanation. Archaeologists do not study the findings that indicate the existence of this civilization because it threatens their existing theories. But is Hancock's idea right? Did an advanced civilization disappear more than 12,000 years ago? Well, it's hard to say. Either way, Hancock has spent decades in his vision quest to find the sages who brought us civilization, but decades of searching have failed to produce enough evidence to convince archaeologists that the standard timeline of human history needs major revision. Hancock's plaint is that mainstream science is stuck in a uniform Atarian model of slow, gradual change and so cannot accept a catastrophic explanation. 
not true. From the origin of the universe, Big Bang, to the origin of the moon, Big Collision, to the origin of lunar craters, meteor strikes, to the demise of the dinosaurs, asteroid impact, to the numerous sudden downfalls of civilizations documented by Jared Diamond in his 2005 book, Collapse. Catastrophism is alive and well in mainstream science. The real magicians are the scientists who have worked this all out. While the existence of an advanced civilization more than 12,000 years ago remains a puzzle, we know that when we can figure out how to isolate and identify life forms that thrive in similarly extreme surroundings on Earth like Antarctica, we're a step ahead in searching for life in places much further afield, such as in the outer reaches of our solar system. It's difficult to pin down when the search for life among the stars morphed from science fiction to science, but 1K Milestone was an astronomy meeting in November 1961. It was organized by Frank Draca, a young radio astronomer, who was intrigued with the idea of searching for alien radio transmissions. When he called the meeting, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI, was essentially taboo in astronomy. But with his lab director's blessing, he brought in a handful of astronomers, chemists, biologists, and engineers, including a young planetary scientist named Carl Sagan, to discuss what is now called astrobiology, the science of life beyond Earth. In particular, Drake wanted some expert help in deciding how sensible it might be to devote significant radio telescope time to listening for alien broadcasts and what might be the most promising way to search. How many civilizations might reasonably be out there, he wondered. So before his guests arrived, he scribbled an equation on the blackboard. That scribble, now famous as the Drake Equation, lays out a process for answering his question. You start out with the formation rate of sun-like stars in the Milky Way, then multiply that by the fraction of such stars that have planetary systems. Take the resulting number and multiply that by the number of life-friendly planets on average in each such system. Planets, that is, that are about the size of Earth and orbit, at the right distance from their star, to be hospitable to life. Multiply that by the fraction of those planets where life arises, then by the fraction of those where life evolves intelligence, and then by the fraction of those that might develop the technology to emit radio signals we could detect. The final step, multiply the number of radio-savvy civilizations by the average time they're likely to keep broadcasting or even to survive. If such advanced societies typically blow themselves up in a nuclear holocaust, just a few decades after developing radio technology, for example, there would probably be very few to listen for at any given time. The equation made perfect sense, but there was one problem. Nobody had a clue what any of those fractions or numbers were, except for the very first variable in the equation, the formation rate of sun-like stars. The rest was pure guesswork. Of course, if SETI scientists managed to snag an extraterrestrial radio signal, these uncertainties wouldn't matter. But until that happened, experts on every item in the Drake equation would have to try to fill it in by nailing down the numbers, by finding the occurrence rate for planets around sun-like stars, or by trying to solve the mystery of how life took root on Earth. It would be a third of a century before scientists could even begin to put rough estimates into the equation. In 1995, Michel Mayor and Didier Queloz of the University of Geneva detected the first planet orbiting a sun-like star outside our solar system. That world, known as 51 Pegasi b, about 50 light-years from Earth, is a huge, gaseous blob about half the size of Jupiter, with an orbit so tight that its year is only four days long and its surface temperature close to 2,000 to gif. Nobody thought for a moment that life could ever take hold in such hellish conditions. But the discovery of even a single planet was an enormous breakthrough. Early the next year, Jeffrey Marcy, then at San Francisco State University and now at UC Berkeley, would lead his own team in finding a second extrasolar planet, then a third. After that, the floodgates opened. To date, 
astronomers have confirmed more than 5,000 so-called exoplanets, ranging in size from smaller than Earth to bigger than Jupiter. None of these planets is an exact match for Earth, but scientists are confident they'll find one that is before too long. Based on the discoveries of somewhat larger planets made to date, astronomers recently calculated that more than a fifth of stars like the Sun harbor habitable, Earth-like planets. Statistically speaking, the nearest one could be a mere 12 light years away, which is practically next door in cosmic terms. That's good news for astrobiologists. But in recent years, planet hunters have realized that there's no reason to limit their search to stars just like our sun. In the words of David Charbonneau, an astronomer at Harvard, when I was in high school, we were taught that Earth orbits an average star. But that's a lie. In fact, about 80% of the stars in the Milky Way are small, cool, dim, redish bodies known as M dwarfs. If an Earth-like planet circled an M dwarf at the right distance, it would have to be closer in than. The Earth is to our sun to avoid being too cold. It could provide a place where life could gain a foothold just as easily as on an Earth-like planet orbiting a sun-like star. Moreover, scientists now believe a planet doesn't have to be the same size as Earth to be habitable. But according to Dimitar Sasilov, another Harvard astronomer, anywhere from one to five Earth masses is ideal. In short, the variety of habitable planets and the stars they might orbit is likely to be far greater than what Drake and his fellow conferees conservatively assumed at that meeting back in 1961. That's not all. It turns out that the range of temperatures and chemical environments where extremophilic organisms might be able to thrive is also greater than anyone at Drake's meeting could have imagined. In the 1970s, oceanographers such as National Geographic explorer in residence Robert Ballard discovered superheated gushers, known as hydrothermal vents, nourishing a rich ecosystem of bacteria. Feasting on hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals dissolved in the water, these microbes in turn feed higher organisms. Scientists have also found life forms that flourish in hot springs, in frigid lakes, thousands of feet below the surface of the Antarctic ice sheet, in highly acidic or highly alkaline or extremely salty or radioactive locations, and even in minute cracks in solid rock a mile or more underground. According to Lisa Kaltenegger, who holds joint appointments at Harvard and the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, Germany, on Earth these are niche environments. But on another planet, you can easily envision that they could be dominant scenarios. The one factor that biologists argue is critical for life, as we know it, is water in liquid form, a powerful solvent capable of transporting dissolved nutrients to all parts of an organism. In our own solar system, we've known since the Mariner 9 Mars Orbiter mission in 1971 that water once likely flowed freely on the Red Planet. So life might have existed there, at least in microbial form, and it's plausible that remnants of that life could still endure underground where liquid water may linger. Jupiter's moon Europa also shows cracks in its relatively young ice-covered surface, evidence that beneath the ice lies an ocean of liquid water. At a half billion miles or so from the sun, Europa's water should be frozen solid. But this moon is constantly flexing under the tidal push and pull of Jupiter and several of its other moons, generating heat that could keep the water below liquid. In theory, life could exist in that water too. In 2005, NASA's Cassini spacecraft spotted jets of water erupting from Saturn's moon Enceladus. Subsequent measurements by the spacecraft reported in April of this year confirm an underground source of water on that moon as well. However, scientists still don't know how much water might be under Enceladus's icy shell or whether it's been liquid long enough to permit life to exist. The surface of Titan, Saturn's largest moon, has rivers, lakes, and rain. But Titan's meteorological cycle is based on liquid hydrocarbons, such as methane and ethane, not water. Something might be alive there, but what it would be like is very hard to guess. Mars is far more Earth-like and far closer than any of these distant moons. 
The search for life has driven virtually every mission to the Red Planet. The NASA rover Curiosity is currently exploring Gale Crater, where a huge lake sat billions of years ago and where it's now clear that the chemical environment would have been hospitable to microbes if they existed. A cave in Mexico isn't Mars, of course, and a lake in northern Alaska isn't Europa. But it's the search for extraterrestrial life that has taken JPL astrobiologist Kevin Hand and the other members of his team, including John Leichty, to Sukok Lake, 20 miles from Barrow, Alaska. The same quest has lured Penelope Boston and her colleagues multiple times to the poisonous Cueva de Villa Luz, a cave near Tapijulapa in Mexico. In particular, they're looking for biosignatures, visual or chemical clues that signal the presence of life, past or present, in places where scientists won't have the luxury of doing sophisticated laboratory experiments. Take the Mexican cave. Orbiting spacecraft have shown that caves do exist on Mars, and they're just the sorts of places where microbes might have taken refuge when the planet lost its atmosphere and surface water some three billion years ago. Such Martian cave dwellers would have had to survive on an energy source other than sunlight, like the dripping ooze that has Boston so enchanted. The scientists refer to these unlovely droplets as snotites. One of thousands in the cave, varying in length from a fraction of an inch to a couple of feet, it does look uncannily like mucus. It's actually a biofilm, a community of microbes bound together in a viscous, gooey blob. The snotite microbes are chemotrophs, Boston explains. They oxidize hydrogen sulfide, that's their only energy source, and they produce this goo as part of their lifestyle. Snotites are just one of the microbial communities that exist here. Boston, of the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and the National Cave and Karst Research Institute, says that all told there are about a dozen communities of microbes in the cave. Each one has a very distinct physical appearance. Each one is tapping into different nutrient systems. One of these communities is especially intriguing to Boston and her colleagues. It doesn't form drips or blobs, but instead makes patterns on the cave walls, including spots, lines, and even networks of lines that look almost like hieroglyphics. Astrobiologists have come to call these patterns biovermiculations, or bioverms for short, from the word vermiculation, meaning decorated with irregular patterns of lines as though made by worm tracks. It turns out that patterns like these aren't made only by microorganisms growing on cave walls. It happens on a variety of different scales, usually in places where some resource is in short supply, says Keith Schubert, a Baylor University engineer who specializes in imaging systems and who came to Cueva de Villa Luz to set up cameras for long-term monitoring inside the cave. Grasses and trees in arid regions create bioverm patterns as well, says Schubert. So do soil crusts, which are communities of bacteria, mosses, and lichens that cover the ground in deserts. If this hypothesis holds up, and it's still only a hypothesis, then Boston, Schubert, and other scientists who are documenting bioverms may have found something crucially important. Until now, many of the markers of life astrobiologists have looked for are gases, like oxygen, that are given off by organisms on Earth. But life that produces an oxygen biosignature may be only one kind among many. What excites me about bioverms, says Boston, is that we've seen them at all these different scales and in all these wildly different environments, and yet the characters of the patterns are very similar. It's highly plausible, she and Schubert believe, that these patterns, based on simple rules of growth and competition for resources, could be literally a universal signature of life. In caves, moreover, even when the microbial communities die, they leave the patterns behind. If a rover should see something like this on the wall of a Martian cave, says Schubert, it could direct you where to focus your attention. At the opposite end of North America, the scientists and engineers shivering at Sukok Lake are on a similar mission. They're working at two different locations on the lake, one next to a cluster of three small tents the scientists have dubbed Nassaville, and the other with just a single tent about a half mile away as the crow flies because methane gas bubbling from the lake bottom churns up the water, 
Ice has a hard time forming in some places. To snowmobile from one camp to the other, the scientists have to take a curving, indirect route to avoid a potentially fatal dunking. It was the methane that first drew the scientists to Sukok and other nearby Alaska lakes back in 2009. This common hydrocarbon gas is generated by microbes, known collectively as methanogens, that decompose organic matter, making it another potential biosignature astrobiologists could look for on other worlds. But methane also comes from volcanic eruptions and other non-biological sources, and it forms naturally in the atmosphere of giant planets like Jupiter, as well as on Saturn's moon, Titan. So it's crucial that scientists be able to distinguish biological methane from its non-biological cousin. If you're focused on ice-covered Europa, ice-covered methane-rich Sukok Lake isn't a bad place to get your feet wet, as long as you don't do it literally. This makes the idea of sending a probe to orbit Europa all the more compelling. A piece of good news, in October, NASA's scheduled to launch a spacecraft to one of Jupiter's 92 known moons an icy marble named Europa. The probe's main purpose? To help scientists figure out if Europa can support life as we know it. This robotic explorer is aptly called the Europa Clipper, and according to a release put out by the agency on late January, Clipper's looking pretty ready for its cosmic journey. In short, all of its nine science instruments and a telecommunication system have been installed at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. The technology hall includes gear like a mass spectrometer that'll measure the mass-to-charge ratio of gas molecules on Europa, a surface dust analyzer, and an imaging spectrometer that'll study interactions between light and matter to map out the moon's ices, salts, and organic molecules. Of course, there are also cameras aboard Europa Clipper that NASA says will take wide-angle and narrow-angle shots of the moon's icy surface. We can expect some cool color pictures to show us what it might be like to stand on a moon hundreds of millions of miles from our planet. This is quite intriguing because, aside from the obvious reasons, getting new and detailed data about Europa's surface may explain some puzzling things scientists have been seeing, such as a study that suggests NASA's Jupiter studying Juno spacecraft detected recent activity in the region. Speaking of, because of that incredibly huge distance, Clipper is set to arrive in the Jupiter system no earlier than 2030. The spacecraft will orbit the giant planet for at least four years, performing 49 close flybys of Europa during that stretch. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.